and counseling will have to first know the salient points in the course of interviewing a client. First, we'll have to establish the attorney-client relationship. This is the initial step a lawyer should start to perform an act constituting as practice of law. With such relationship, rights and obligations can be invoked and enforced, like right to payment of attorney's fees and right to mental privileged communication. Of course, the client should be aware of his responsibilities towards the lawyer. That one, lawyer is entitled to attorney's fees. Any counsel who is worthy of his hire is entitled to be fully recompensed for his services with his capital consisting solely of his brains and with his skill acquired a tremendous cost not only in money but in the expenditure of time and energy he is entitled to the protection of any judicial tribunal against any attempt on the part of the client to escape payment of his fees. This is from Albano versus Coloma. And, client cannot dismiss lawyer at will. To note, lawyer may withdraw his services under the following circumstances. First, when client pursues an illegal or immoral cause of action in connection with the matter he is handling. Second, when the client insists that the lawyer pursue a conduct violative of these canons and rules. Third, when his inability to work with co-counsel will not promote the best interests of the client. Fourth, when the mental or physical condition of the lawyer renders it difficult for him to carry out the employment effectively. Fifth, when the client deliberately fails to pay the fees for the services or fails to comply with retainer agreement and other similar cases. Third point, lawyer's authority to control trial is limited only to matters of procedure. In interviewing a client, it must be all-encompassing and exhaustive. All points of the case must be covered by the interviewing lawyer. A lot of psychology must be used in interviewing. A lawyer must observe the mannerisms of the client because by reason of fear, anguish, excitement, or all other emotions, the client has the propensity to tell a lie. He may add or omit some facts or tell a patent lie all throughout just to save himself from any liability. But nevertheless, a lawyer must let the client speak spontaneously without any interruptions except when necessary to clarify a point. So, how do we conduct an interview? First, a lawyer must be frank and firm, just like this. Wala lagi ko sala, sir. Dili lagi ako nagbuhat ato, sir. Mr. Leal, just answer my questions, okay? I understand what you're feeling right now. Just uh, tell me what really happened. Okay, where were you at the time when the victim was stabbed to death? Sa pagkaalala ko, sir, ara ko sa Dabao, put kami ni mama ko, dito ko natulog. Okay, why is there a witness telling that you are the one who stabbed the client, the victim? Dili lagi ako to, sir. Kaya nalagi ko sa akong mama. Niya ay nagatupot ko sa anak ko dito sa akong lula de ay, sa lagaw. Dito ko nag-overnight. Mr. Leal, I am the lawyer here. Just answer the question. You told me you were with your mother and then now with your grandma. So, saan ka ba talaga at that time of death of the victim? Nalagi ko sa akong lula. Dito ko sa lagaw. My God, Mr. Leal. Just be honest. I can't, I can't accept any half-truth, half-lies from you. I am your defendant. I have to know everything. If there is something to be, to be hidden, it's up to me. I will tell you what it is. But tell me everything. Okay, as what you have seen, the client has the propensity to lie because of the fear to, be, to have any liability with regards to the stabbing or any crime that has been accused of him. Uh, a lawyer must be firm and frank. Second, a lawyer must not interrupt the client when doing the interview. You must let the client speak spontaneously, as mentioned earlier. 
because there is a tendency that the trend of thought of the client would be disrupted and he may miss some material facts which is relevant to the case. Third thing, a lawyer must know the dialect or the local language where he has an office because basically most of the clients that the law, that lawyer would be handling would be the individuals of the locality. Just imagine if a lawyer could not relay the message that he is saying or that he could not understand what the client is telling. But the lawyer does not need to be a linguist. He just needs to make sure that he is able to relay the point that he wants to arrive with. Okay, good afternoon, Ms. Simeon. Um, as far as I've read on your um, information uh, given by the secretary, uh, he told me, uh, she told me here that um, your husband eloped with another girl, is that correct? Uh, Ms. Donna? Um, your husband eloped with another girl or another woman. Did he have any, any uh, sons or daughters with that woman? Ms. Donna? Um, hindi ko gid abi maintindihan sir ba? Oh. An ano nga ibig mo nga sabihin man sir? Oh, oh, I see Miss Simeon. Um ilongga ka man gali, ma'am. Ang akon pamangkot is nag nag kabit gali ang imo nga husband. Tama? Amo ni Ambaldeo. Oo oh, sir, hindi ambot sito sa iya ang Basta ang balan ko lang uh, may ara to siya sa babae to. Hindi ko balan ko. Nakita to siya sa among nga kapitbahay. Tay ano na tabu? Oh, may ara ka mo may ano? May ginawayan ka mo duha? O oh, chikstira? Dalang gito. Balita, balita abid doon sa among sir nga doa, damo doa abid na siya gina lagaw-lagaw to. Hindi ko balan. As you have seen, there are a lot of dialects here in the Philippines. We have the Ilongo, the Bisaya, the Cebuano, we have the Blaan, the Thausug, the Islam, the Maranao, especially here in Mindanao. But basically, our law accepts Tagalog and English as an official language. Um, fourth one, it, it, the lawyer must interview all of the witnesses available. He must create a solid proof. He must collaborate all of the, all of the uh, statements of the witnesses. Although not all witnesses needs to be presented in court because there are some witnesses whose statements are just corroborative. However, all of the resources, all of the materials, all of the witnesses must be covered by the lawyer. That's it. Thank you. Trial Brief Preparation Trial Brief Preparation is essential to a lawyer to avoid cramming or disorganized presentation of evidence or simple mistake or failure to present a vital evidence for lack of a guide or written reminder in front of him. The following are the W's why a lawyer should consider preparing a trial brief. First, what? A trial brief is a legal writing that is filed with the court shortly before trial or during trial that addresses relevant evidentiary and legal issues for the court to consider. Second, who? A good trial is usually equipped with a trial brief before appearing in court. Third, when? Before going to trial. Fourth, where? A lawyer should prepare his or her trial in his office and before his or her appearance in court. Lastly, why? For more effective and systematic presentation of evidence. As we all know, trial brief is incorporated to our rules of court and form an integral part as additional provision of our very own rules of court under Rule 18, Section 6. Determine the client's needs and priorities. Lawyers should determine the client's needs and priorities because he or she is the sole in charge for this matter in determining his her clients need and priorities. It happens when clients comes into the office of a practicing lawyer with his her bag full of complaints. The following are the sample cases and remedies under this topic. First, in the case of philandering wife, 
the potential claims of the aggrieved spouse are the following. First, principal action for annulment of marriage on the ground of psychological incapacity. Second, action for custody of minor, minor children in her custody for being an incompetent and scandalous mother. Third, habeas corpus petition to regain custody of the minor children. And lastly, prayer for moral damages, compensatory and consequential damages, attorney's fees and costs. Meanwhile, on the part of defendant wife, the following remedies, defenses and counterclaims may be availed of. First, defense of sexual impotency and refusal to give support, lack of love and attention of a concerned husband, bordering on abandonment. Second, defense that plaintiff husband is incompetent to attend the welfare of the children, hence to gain custody of them. Third, permissive counterclaim of support pendentilite and thereafter up to the dissolution of marriage. Fourth, counterclaim for award of actual, moral, and consequential damages. And lastly, counterclaim for payment of attorney's fees in cost. For the second case, where a client hired a lawyer's services with a complaint that her son is a victim of vehicular accident, as a consequence of which he sustained serious physical injuries, became mental retarded, and a computation of all expenses incurred yielded 1 million pesos. For the complaint, the potential claims and legal remedies would include the following. First, Criminal action against the earring driver for the purpose of securing conviction to hold employers subsidiary liable under Article 103 of the Revised Penal Code. Second, action for quasi delict under Articles 2176, 2180, 2184 of the Civil Code. Third, prosecution under 263 of the Revised Penal Code. Fourth, direct independent civil action for damages against the employer of the earring driver. Fifth, provisional remedy of attachment against the employer's properties. And lastly, motion to suspend criminal case before government prosecutor's office on the ground of pendency of prejudicial question in a pending civil action for damages against employer of the vehicle. On the part of defendant, the following remedies, defenses may be availed of. First, that the offended party is guilty of contributory negligence. Second, that the earring driver exercised the diligence of good father of a family to avoid accident. Third, that the earring driver accused exercised the last clear chance to avoid hitting the victim. Fourth, that the offended party was at fault in that he was one who bumped on the vehicle instead of the other way around. Fifth, that the employer exercised diligence in the selection and supervision of his employer driver. And lastly, for dissolution of attachment in case of one is issued on employer's property by filing a counterband which should be filed simultaneously with the filing of a motion to quash the attachment order. If you have a legal problem, is it necessary that you go directly to a lawyer and file a case in court? The answer is no, because we have first to settle an amicable settlement. Aside from saving money, is to avoid a prolonged litigation. And as long as the judgment has not yet become final and executory, the parties could still enter into an out-of-court settlement from which the court's judgment shall be adopted subject to the court's approval. In the case of Clark Development Corporation versus Mundragon Leisure and Resorts Corporation, it is provided that a compromise agreement is binding and has the force of law between the parties once it has been signed by the parties, litigants, and approved by the court, unless the consent of a party is vitiated, such as by mistake, fraud, violence, intimidation, or undue influence, or 
when there is forgery or if the terms or the settlement are so palpably unconscionable. Then let's go to the analysis and development of theory. The steps of analysis and development of theory are the following. First, interview of the witnesses, including the client. Second, evaluation and analysis of the facts. Third, build a court-bound case with a valid cause of action. Fourth, research on the provisions of the substantial and procedural laws that are applicable. Fifth, analyze the facts on the basis in relation to the applicable legal provisions. Sixth, check and countercheck whether the theory will prosper by availing of the remedies and or defenses under the rules of court. And lastly, study further and read some past and recent jurisprudence. These are the following references that you may apply in researching some of the jurisprudence. These are your references. Philippine Supreme Court Decisions Philippine Reports Supreme Court's Reports Annotated or SCRA Corpus Juris Secundum Treaties and Legal Writings of Renowned Writers Law Textbooks Rules of Courts Interim Rules of Court 1997 Rules of Civil Procedure Revised Rules of Criminal Procedure Civil Code of the Philippines or the Republic Act No. 386 Family Code of the Philippines or the Republic Act No. 209 Revised Penal Code Codal and Annotated Court of Appeal Decision Opinions of the Secretary of Justice Lectures of Legal Authorities and Administrative Orders of Different Administrative Agencies Next, let's proceed to the Theory of the Case Development The Theory or Defense in a case must remain constant up to the termination of the case, which includes the appeal stage of review by the appellate court. The theory of the case lies at the very foundation of the case. It is the particular line of reasoning of either party to suit and aim to bring together certain facts of the case in a logical sequence and correlate them in such a manner as to produce in the mind a definite result or conclusion that the advocate believes entitles him to the court judgment or decree in the face of such conclusion based on certain principles of law. Be reminded, according to Rule 10, Section 2 and 3 of the Rules of Court, it is to be noted that pleadings may be amended once as a matter of right before service of a responsive pleading is permitted and before the action is placed in the trial calendar and thereafter by leave of court. However, this leave of court may be refused by the court if the theory or defense is substantially altered. Let's have a hypothetical case on how to apply this theory. For example, A borrowed money from B for a purpose of a loan. B granted the loan of A. And to secure the loan, A signed a document entitled Deed of Sale with the Right to Repurchase in favor of B. Eventually, a defaulted up from payment to B. Consequently, B consolidated the property of A. Now, by virtue of the certificate of title in favor of B, he demanded that A vacate the premises. But A refused to, to vacate the premises. B filed a case for the recovery of the property and possession against A. So, the problem now lies here. If we are the counsel of A, what would be our theory in this case? 
we have to remember that the purpose of A in borrowing money from B is that for the purpose of a loan and not to sell the property. But here, A is unschooled. She did not understand quite well that B was going to consolidate the title to her property upon default of the payment for the loan. So A's real intention is that not to sell the land. Here we have to prove our theory that A's intention is to borrow and not to sell the property. your client accused in a criminal case, how will you defend your client? Here are the suggested defective theories in criminal cases. The theory of self-defense, mistake in the identity of the victim, insanity, minority of the offender, and alibi. There are two types of self-defense. First is the complete self-defense. These when all the elements that justify the act of the killing are present. The elements of self-defense are unlawful aggression do not come from the accused, that he is not guilty of sufficient provocation, that there is reasonable necessity of the means employed to repel or prevent the aggression. The second type of self-defense is incomplete self-defense. It is when all the elements that justify the act of the killing are lacking. Take note, it is necessary that the majority of the requirements of self-defense be present, particularly the requisite of unlawful aggression on the part of the victim. Mistake in the identity of the victim, which may either be error in personae or mistake of the person or aburatio ictus or mistake in the blow. Error in personae occurs when the offender actually hit the person to whom the blow was directed but turned out to be different from and not the victim intended. Mistake in the blow occurs when the offender delivered the blow at his intended victim but missed and instead such blow landed on an intended victim. Insanity. Insanity is understood as a mental defect or disease that makes it impossible for a defendant to understand their actions. When insanity is used as a defense, the burden is on the defense as the appellant has to prove that the perpetrator is insane immediately before the commission of the crime or at the moment of its execution. There should be proof that the accused acted without discernment. Minority of the Offender Republic Act No. 9344 provides that the minimum age of criminal responsibility shall be 15 years of age and below at the time of the commission of the offense. Alibi The accused must prove not only that he was at some other place at the time of the commission of the crime, but also that it was physically impossible for him to be at the locus delecti or within its immediate vicinity. Next is the investigation during the pendency of an action. Investigation is the collection and analysis of evidence. Ocular inspection is a mode of discovery also known as view of an object. Under Rule 27, Section 1 of the Rules of Court, upon motion of any party showing good cause, therefore, the court in which an action is pending may order any party to produce and permit the inspection and copying or photographing by or on behalf of the moving party of any designated documents, papers, books, accounts, letters, photographs, objects, or tangible things, not privilege, which constitute or contain evidence material to any matter involved in the action and which are in his possession, custody, or control or order any party to permit entry upon designated land or other property in his possession or control for the purpose of inspecting, measuring, surveying, or photographing the property or any designated relevant object or operation thereon. The order shall specify the time, place, and manner of making the inspection and taking copies and photographs and may prescribe such terms and conditions as are just. These can be resorted to in the following cases. Actions for recovery of possession and ownership of real property, annulment of title, eminent domain, ejectment proceedings and land registration cases, criminal prosecutions for usurpation of real rights over real property, 
murder or homicide where place of incident is an issue, theft or robbery in order to appraise the court whether or not a crime was committed in an enclosed premises, arson, crimes of trespass to private property or dwelling in order to determine the probability or improbability of the accused to commit trespass considering the physical condition of the dwelling or whether or not the place intended for entrance is restricted to the public. Vehicular incidents to determine the point of impact, to find traces of tire marks, to determine the relative distance of one vehicle to another from the time of impact, and thereafter, for the purpose of finding whether the erring vehicle was running at a speed faster than that allowed by law, or the distance where the body of the victim was thrown from the point of impact. And lastly, to take a picture of the place of burning taken immediately before and after the burning. Section 12, Article 3 of the 1987 Constitution provides, Any person under investigation for a commission of an offense shall have the right to remain silent and to have competent and independent counsel, preferably of his own choice. If the person cannot afford the services of counsel, he must be provided with one. These rights cannot be waived except in writing and in the presence of counsel. Now let's go forward to the probative value of an extrajudicial confession. What is an extrajudicial confession? As held in People v. Fabro, an extrajudicial confession is a declaration made voluntarily and without compulsion or inducement by a person stating that he had committed a crime or he has participation in the commission of the offense. What is the probative value of an extrajudicial confession? As held in People v. Nicandro, when the Constitution requires a person under investigation to be informed of his right to remain silent and to counsel, it must be presumed to contemplate the transmission of meaningful information rather than just the ceremonial and perfunctory recitation of an abstract constitutional principle. In People v. Albufera, the Supreme Court held that extrajudicial confessions taken without the assistance of counsel is inadmissible in evidence. How do we determine if an extrajudicial confession is admissible in evidence? So there are three st uh, tests of admissibility. First, we have to know if the extrajudicial confession is sufficiently corroborated with corpus delicti. Second, we have to assess if the extrajudicial confession is made voluntarily based on the test of voluntariness as held in People v. Gallit. And third, we have to assess if there were sufficient warnings uh, said to the accused before the taking of his confession about his waiver of his right to counsel. Now, we have to remember that in these three tests of admissibility, the most important one is that the extrajudicial confession is made voluntarily and without inducement and that it is corroborated with evidence of corpus delicti. This is held in the case of People v. Gallit. If the accused chooses to waive his right to counsel in saying or in making his extrajudicial confession, such waiver should still be assisted with counsel. Even if it is not, uh, even if the counsel is not of his own choice, it should still be provided by the interrogating or the investigating officer. Now that we know the basics of an extrajudicial confession, we have to know what are the steps in taking an extrajudicial confession. Now let us remember that an extrajudicial confession may only be made by a person if he is detained, arrested, or if he is under custodial investigation. Now these are the steps. First, at the time of the arrest, the person arrested should be informed of the reason for his arrest. Second, the warrant of arrest must be shown to the person arrested if there is a warrant of arrest. However, if it is a valid, valid warrantless arrest pursuant to Section 5, Rule 110 of the Rules of Court, then no need for us to show the warrant of arrest to the arrested person. Now, as a review, under Section 5, Rule 110 of the Rules of Court, a valid warrantless arrest may be affected by the arresting officer under three instances. First, if 
the person ar arrested has committed a crime, is actually committing a crime, or is attempting to commit a crime. Second, if a crime has in fact just been committed and the person arrested uh, and the person arresting has personal knowledge that the person to be arrested has committed the crime. And third, if the person to be arrested has escaped detention or there is a pending case against the person to be arrested. The third step in taking an extrajudicial confession is that the person arrested, detained, or under custodial investigation must be informed of his constitutional right to remain silent and of his right to counsel. And the fourth step is that the person arrested should be informed that any statement he might make could be used against him. Now, the third and fourth steps basically are the reading of the Miranda rights to the in favor of the person arrested, detained, or under custodial investigation. Now, we have to remember that in reading or in saying the Miranda rights in favor of the person arrested, such reading, there must be a meaningful transmission of information to the person arrested or detained. It should not be just a ceremonial reading or a perfunctory reading of the abstract constitutional rights of the person arrested. Now, the fifth step in taking an extrajudicial confession is that the person arrested, detained, or under custodial investigation should be given time and sufficient opportunity to communicate with his lawyer, any relative, or any person of his choice by expedient means. Now, under the fourth step again, the person is given the right or sufficient opportunity to communicate with his counsel. Now, what if the person arrested, detained, or under custodial investigation cannot afford the services or cannot afford to hire services of his own counsel? Now, we move forward to the fifth step. And the fifth step is that the person arrested, detained, or under custodial investigation must be provided with counsel by the investigating or the interrogating officer. The seventh step is that the extrajudicial confession should be reduced in writing and must be signed by the person arrested, detained, or under custodial investigation in the presence of his own counsel or in case he cannot afford the services of his own counsel, the person arrested should um, sign it, sign the extrajudicial confession in the presence of a counsel provided by the investigating officer. Now, the next step is that if the person arrested, detained, or under custodial investigation does not have counsel of his own, or if no counsel can be provided to him in, uh, by the investigating or the interrogating officer, then no custodial investigation must be conducted. Instead, the person detained, arrested, or under custodial investigation may only be detained in the premises pursuant to Article 125 of the Revised Penal Code. Now, as a refresher, under 100, Article 125 of the Revised Penal Code, a person arrested may only be detained depending on the offense he was arrested for. If the offense that he was arrested for is, uh, is punishable by light penalty or its equivalent, he may only be detained for 12 hours. If it is punishable by correctional penalty or its equivalent, he may only be detained within 18 hours. And if the person arrested has, is um, suspected to have committed a crime which is punishable by capital punishment or its equivalent, then he may only be detained for 36 hours. Now, the next step is that if the person arrested will waive his right to counsel, such waiver should still be in writing and should still be made in the assistance of counsel. This is pursuant to the 1987 Constitution saying that if it is the constitutional right of the accused to be assisted by counsel, then even if the, the person arrested would waive his right to such, the waiver should still be in the presence of a counsel that is provided by the investigating or the interrogating officer. Now, the tenth step is, if should the person arrested, detained, or under custodial investigation chooses to sign the extrajudicial confession, which was again reduced in writing, such signing must be made in the presence of his brother, his sister, any relative, the municipal mayor, municipal judge, or any person of authority. The 11th step would be that any waiver 
under the provisions of Article 125 of the Revised Penal Code should still be made in the presence of a counsel. Otherwise, such waiver in favor of the rights under Article 125 of the Revised Penal Code would be null and void. And the last step is after the signing of the person uh, making the extrajudicial confession, the same extrajudicial confession should be attested by the investigating officer or any other witness. So out of these steps that, wa that were enumerated in the book, we have to remember that in making an extrajudicial confession, the same should be reduced in writing and should be made in the presence of counsel. And even if the accused waives his right to counsel, such waiver should still be made in the presence of a counsel, if not of his own choice, it should still be provided by the um, investigating or the interrogating officer. I am tasked to discuss, first, the evidentiary value a police report, autopsy report, and medical report. Second, the procedure in qualifying an expert witness in case the adverse counsel will not admit the competency of the examining physician to testify as an expert witness. And lastly, when to prepare a demand letter. And now, what is police report? It is prepared by a police officer who have conducted an on-the-spot investigation of the scene of the incident. It has a superior probative value and weight in criminal action for reckless imprudence resulting in homicide or physical injury, damage to property through reckless imprudence as well as the action arising from quasi delict Autopsy report is prepared by a medical legal expert who have examined the type of wounds, cause of death, and the trajectory of bullet twins from the body of the victim of a crime. It may also help in finding whether the victim had died only recently or after the lapse of considerable period of time. Medical report or medical certificate is prepared and issued by an examining physician, a material piece of documentary evidence of high probity value, which is indispensable for the filing for charges. Murder, Homicide, parricide, physical injuries, rape, seduction, assault against a person in authority or his agent, traffic accident cases, forcible abduction, and abortion. An inquest prosecutor may refuse to entertain a criminal complaint for a charge of physical injuries or any crime against person for lack of medical certificate. It is also necessary to determine whether the respondent in a vehicular case was driving under the influence of liquor or prohibited drugs. For the second topic, Section 52 of Rule 130 of the Rules of Court, which is the opinion of expert witness, shall apply. The procedure in qualifying an expert witness in case the adverse counsel will not admit the competency of the examining physician to testify as an expert witness. 1. The party presenting him must first establish his qualifications as an expert witness by allowing him to be in the witness stand for the purpose of qualifying himself as such. To do so, it is necessary to Ask preliminary questions to determine witnesses' qualification as an expert, including among others, the educational background, basis of special knowledge and skills acquired, and relevant experience and training. Further, ensure that, number one, the witness testimony is sufficiently based upon reliable facts and data. Number two, the witness's testimony is the product of reliable principles and methods. And last, the witness has applied the principles and methods reliably to the facts of the case. Recall that the general rule under Section 51 of Rule 130 of Rules of Court, 
The opinion of a witness is not admissible. One exception, however, is the opinion of expert witness. Hence, an expert witness must be qualified. And now, moving on to the final topic, when to prepare a demand letter. First, when all material evidence has been gathered and you are convinced that they are sufficient to start a court litigation. Second, after conducting an extensive interview of client and witnesses. And finally, when the objective evaluation of such evidence there exists a valid cause of action, then it is now time to prepare a letter of demand. And more than the lawyer's duty to defend the cause of action, it is still a task to prevent expensive litigations and or explore with the adverse party the possibility of an out-of-court settlement. This is to prevent the parties from the hemorrhaging of their assets and becoming mentally and physically drained attending stress of a litigation. But when all hopes for an amicable settlement have blasted, then as a lawyer, it becomes self-imposed task to protect the interests of client at all costs up to its termination as a concomitant condition of the contract of employment. And that concludes my discussion. Thank you and have a nice day.